it's yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Adnan. So I'm a project manager in uh, the Sirius Center at the University of Oslo. Uh, I'm actually project manager for the projects which are specifically related to oil and gas business, especially with, for the subsurface. Uh, but I'm not a computer scientist, so please bear with me if I say something crazy. Uh, the reason why I swapped my presentation with Mara is that because Mara explained very nicely about the ontologies, what those ontologies are, and uh, why we are using an exploration. So what I, in my talk, I'm actually going to explain one of the application of those ontologies, if we can use uh, this methodology to actually data access and ex exploration. Uh, most of the results that I will show uh, in this presentation is actually derived from a large EU project called OPTIC, uh, where the OPTIC uh, team, the OPTIC, OPTIC project team, along with some of my colleagues at uh, the Sirius Center and University of Oslo, uh, works to develop this technology. So this talk is going to be sort of status of what the state of art, state of the art technology we have. Uh, what are the limitations and what we, at least in our center, what we have planned uh, to develop this technology further. But before we, uh, before I jump into the methodology, I think the RL asked, that, asked the question that what is actually digitalization? And for that, we need to see the workflow that we use in an exploration by taking data and transforming them, transforming that data into the scene. And so we essentially pass through these uh, four steps. We First, we gather all the possible data, and then we, we integrate that data because this data actually consists of different formats, different systematic physics data. So we integrate that data, and then on this integrated data set, we generate insights. And on the basis of these insights, we take drill or drop decisions. Uh, and then it comes to the digitalization in this whole workflow. It actually comes to actually two points here. So the first digitalization, what I consider digitalization in exploration is first to overcome the bottle, bottlenecks of the data access pipeline. So make sure that for each, uh, for each project where we are doing subsurface evaluation to make sure that we have access to all the relevant data, we know the quality of that data, so we do, do not propagate uncertainty right from the beginning. The second thing which is very important in terms of digital transformation in exploration is actually to make best out of this data. For this session, uh, I will only focus on this data access part and I will show you that how the ontologies can be used uh, to, 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 to access this data in a little bit more efficient manner. Uh, Eric explained this, these four Vs uh, very nicely, so I'm not going to explain this again. But the main problem that we have is that we have an enormous amount of data and we are generating this data on a very fast pace. This data comes with a, with a variety of formats, variety of uh, physics involved, and it has actually associated uncertainties in terms of quality uh, of that data. So whoever has worked with the GNG data, they know the fact that, that uh, we spent a lot of amount of time for just finding the right data and doing and making sure that uh, we are using a quality data in, 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 in generating insights. In fact, there are some statistics that say that <coughs> in some time more than up to 70% of the project time is actually used on finding and choosing the data. So if I think about from the geoscientist point of view or the project data manager point of view, who is actually responsible for extracting this data, we have several difficulties here. First is that because uh, the data that we use in subsurface evaluation is actually dispersed in different types, different data sources. So it's really difficult to extract all the data and information. It's not just the seismic, it's not just the well log, but actually we, what we need in a subsurface evaluation is actually information. And sometimes this information is buried in documents, sometimes it's the structured data, sometimes it's the seismic well log. So there are a lot of sources of this data. And it's really difficult uh, to extract all this data and make it available for end users to do the interpretation part. Plus when we talk about the extraction mechanism that we have, uh, we have another difficulty is that if you want, if you want to extract, sorry, okay. So if you want to extract 
uh, information and data based on a very simple queries. For example, if I ask my project data manager that I need of this wall, it will be really easy for him to find that wall. But, but if I define my needs in terms of geological and petrophysical parameters, then it's really difficult to actually extract that data. Another problem that we face is that uh, for ex we have different types of uh, databases in our system. And it is really difficult to extract data from, the, from that databases if actually the person who is trying to access data is a geoscientist or a project data manager because they, are, they don't understand the database structure like I don't understand. Uh, they don't understand the database structure. They don't understand the specific language, for example, SQL or something very complicated, which is used to extract this information. So it's uh, difficult to actually extract data here. Another important thing is that uh, in oil and gas industry, we have a huge amount of textual data. For example, in the National Data Repository of Norway, uh, discuss that have uh, more than one million reports. And there is a huge information just buried in this that report which have not been utilized efficiently. So these are actually the four points where I see is that uh, we are feeling difficulty and we, we need to develop solutions or digitalization solution which can uh, solve some of those problem. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, uh, just to illustrate a bit of uh, problem in more graphical manner. So you have an end user. Uh, here I'm considering end user as a geoscientist or a project data manager. So I'm not considering uh, a person who know SQL or a person who knows database structure. So these are the people who are more or less the middleman between the, geo the, the end user who is uh, interpreting the data and actually the IT uh, expert. So they have applications and in this application they have some predefined queries which are rather very simple queries. And if we have the source of information, the databases in a uniform manner, we can directly use this application by using these predefined queries and we get answers and then the end user can uh, use this data. But in case when, when the information need become complex, when the queries become complex and it have to be, the information have to be extracted from a multiple data sources which have a different architecture then it's actually this man is with the goggles and spikes. This comes into, into the game. So then what he, he actually do is just take all this information needs and then translate into specialized queries using a specialized language and then try to ex extract the information for the end user. Now what happened here is that because then the five minutes task actually becomes a week long task because he have to explain everything to IT expert who are not very well aware of what information that he is trying to extract. Then he tried to translate everything and it takes a long time. And that is actually the reason why uh, there is up to 70% of time actually used in finding and uh, making sure that the data is correct. Can we do something to solve this problem? One of the things that in Optic project we tested is what we call the ontology based data access. So here we are aiming for that, okay, we, we want to find data using complex queries from a multiple disparate data sources and the, the mechanism I will show you in the next slide is that we use mapping and ontology to actually link databases to the, to the uh, end user query interface. This is what was, uh, this is a very, this was a very large project, it's a recently finished project and uh, we actually publish about more than 200 publications from this project. So how the architecture of this ontology based data access look like. So you have the top layer, what we call the presentation layer and it have a functionality. The most important fun functionality here is the visual query system. So this is the system where the end user can formulate uh, complex queries using the vocabulary they use in their daily life. And then it, it have a functionality of visualizing uh, all the information which is actually coming back as a result. Along with this end user, uh, end user part, it actually also have an IT expert part. So it's very important to, to, to know that it's the whole the project, the objective of project is not IT expert to kick or to kick out of the IT expert in the, in the company, but rather they also make their work more interesting for them. So in this whole architecture, the IT expert is actually more or less now maintaining ontologies 
maintain, maintaining mapping and creating more ontologies, adjusting the database uh, uh, structure uh, to run this whole setup. So this is what we call the presentation part, and then we have a data layer part, which uh, consists of different types of data. I have only highlighted one, uh, because in Optic project, uh, the, we had a two use cases. One was with Equinor, from Equinor, which was more focused on exploration data, and then we have we had one case from Siemens where the data was more the streaming data or the sensor data. But here, because we are focusing more on the exploration part, so I have only the, the static part highlighted here. And then the most important thing, which is actually in between the presentation layer and the data layer, is this central architecture, which have ontologies, which actually connect uh, your connect the uh, query interface. Uh, to the to the databases using mapping and this query transformation unit. Uh, so let's take an example to see that how this architecture actually works in, in a real practice. For example, if we have an end users who want to find all boreholes which have an overlap with the drop net formation, and what he actually wants to find is not only the, those well bores, but also he wants to find the pressure measurements and logs from this interval. So now this is a pretty complex query. Uh, there's a lot of factors involved here when this query, query will be run. Uh, what is the traditional way of doing, or how people are doing uh, before this technology, if, if, if they don't use this technology, what's the workflow we have? Is what they will first is that because there is information coming from different data sources, so they have to combine different sub data sets. And by combining these different sub data sets, they try to extract this information, but that will take a long time. An estimate from and from a domain expert in the Equinor says that it might take up to one to two weeks. Plus, not only the time is the important factor, the uncertainty attached to this extraction is also very important. We need to make sure that the information that we are extracting is, is complete and correct which is if you use this manual workflow, there is a huge chance that you probably miss several wells which are had this information. Uh, and can if, if those inf that information can be used in the, in the evaluation part, that can make a big difference. How this query can be run using the OBDA, or ontology-based data access architecture in the uh, Opti. This is the uh, screenshot of uh, VQS, the, uh, the visual query builder in the Opti. So now, instead of writing things in SQL, now uh, the end user, for example, the geoscientist or project data manager, have a functionality where they can use ontology, for example, because right now we are looking for well data, so there is an ontology for defining what are the possible things that can be in the well. And then the end user actually can pick up some, some, some uh, properties of the well and can combine together to actually make, to formulate a really complex query. What we had before was the predefined query like we have in, in most of the system where you have limited options of what information you can combine to extract the data. But here the queries are very flexible. Uh, they can ex exclude or include a lot of properties and then it, they, it, it can form a really complex query. Uh, along with this visual query system where you have these boxes and all those things, it is still possible uh, to have a little bit complex uh, if someone is really into the coding, <laughs> is to formulate something what we call the Sparkle query. So it's not as complicated as the SQL, but still a little bit of programming here. So this um, Optic actually had both of these functionalities. So if someone wants to uh, formulate a query do, do using Sparkle, he can use that if he don't like the picking up boxes in the individual query system. But so we have this now Sparkle or visual query. The next thing is that this, this query will be uh, translated into the real query language like SQL. And the, the here objective is that he don't need to go to the IT expert to do that. And this is what we had in this in, in terms of mapping and query transformation system. Uh, so it will actually convert it into SQL query automatically. Uh, it it's looks like a short query, but it is like this actually code consists of more than 80 lines, and it's pretty complex. 
So it is actually now, now the system is going to search this, uh, the data for this query from five databases. It consists of 24 union clauses and, it and have a joins of 22. How this SQL query actually look like in, in execution is something like this, which uh, I'm pretty sure even uh, if a geoscientist has worked in IT domain for 10 years, he would not be able to understand what this is. But this is the thing, because this is what we want to remove this silo that we always, geoscientist or project data manager, had to be dependent on, on, uh, on an IT expert in terms of formulating queries, uh, like a 10 queries a day. So this is how the SQL query, SQL query will look like when execution, and then the execution time is right now for this query was five minutes only. So we moved from weeks time to five minutes and giving more options, more possibility to end user to formulate a pretty complex query. So this is the results look like in, in more like a, a, a language type. And then uh, this is just for one well which, which was extracted. And along with that, uh, we had this one GIS tool within the optic where you can display your information what wells you have out there. And this is again the same mapping which explained how the information was extracted here. Uh, to sum up the uh, results from this uh, OBDA structure for the ex extracting the ex uh, exploration data, we were managed to reduce or we were, we were managed to reduce the time required to run this type of queries from several weeks to five minutes and it's, it's significant. Uh, it is easy to now for Adnan, can I invite you to conclude because... Uh, yeah, yes, I just have two more slides. Very good. It's easy, it is now easy for end user to formulate query in the Visual Query System. Uh, it can link all this information to any GIS tool. And here we are actually uh, running queries on uh, multiple data sources. But that's, it doesn't mean that we have solved all those problems. And this, because this was more or less a proof of concept research project, and there are certain limitations. Uh, so without removing these, those limitations, it's not possible to directly use it in an industrial setup. It does, the system was designed only for the relational databases, so it does not support non-relational databases. The geoscience ontology which was created was very limited because the reason for running this project was to prove the concept. And it does not support, um, I have just one minute. This is so I have to be the bad guy, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, have to, we have to go further. Uh, the, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, give me 10 seconds only. <laughs> <laughs> so the important thing is that it has some limitations. And so then we have planned to launch a new project where we have now applied for Petromax funding with Lundin and Equinor. Uh, trying to address all those problems that we haven't addressed in the, in the optic. And so hopefully we will get uh, this application approved and we will start working with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we, I think we have two eminent uh, presentations that we can have into the discussions and we, uh, we take the, uh, the questions uh, at the end. Then, Eduardo, I invite you to the floor. A, um, Eduardo Camponogara, professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. When you say that, you know it's like music. Your name and the university. <laughs> and you are a true friend of um, Norway, I understand. You have had collaboration with, um, with NTNU many, many, many years. Of course, I think uh, I have more cooperation no with Norway than anywhere else. Um, so let me bring my presentation up here. Um, hopefully this works. Okay. Okay. 
cannot see the, uh, okay so the work then well this presentation is somewhat different than the previous ones because it's more about what is happening at the low level but it's I, I think it's somewhat more concrete so it builds on uh, my past experience on production optimization and um, this is what I'm planning to say uh, some motivation for for the work um, there are two past experiences one on proxy modeling and production optimization a second one more recent is online learning control and some final remarks so I was thinking about digitalization, and uh, I think it's not hard to come up with the fact that the power of data information is not new. Uh, it's been around for ages. So maybe what is new is the fact that today, data is widespread and available in large volumes, and you might also say that we have computational power to process data. So, what we really want to go is from data, information, knowledge, and then you know, insight and wisdom if we are talking about humans, but if you're talking about systems, we are talking about decisions. So if you take Petrobras, for instance, okay, um, oil companies have streams of data coming from all over, you know, thousands and thousands of sensors. Petrobras has this system called PI, Process Information System, and uh, you can get information about any sensor in a platform, downhole, you know, logistics. So there's a multitude of data really available. So what is the challenge in digitalization? Well, it's not on collecting data. We can really do that today. But rather on transforming this data into knowledge and then taking this knowledge to make better decisions at all levels of any system organization and the hope is that that will improve operations and drive gains. Okay, so I have two experiences um, that to some extent have um, relied on data. One is the experience on using data in modeling in production optimization and an ongoing research on online learning control. So I'll go through that as fast as I can. Okay, so here data comes into developing proxy models in production optimization, but these are the special proxy models that have a structure and that allows us to optimize, to find global optima. So this is part of research that we've been doing in cooperation with Petrobras for more than 10 years that uh, the latest parts involve the, the optimization of the whole system in Santos. We, we developed mathematical models that represent platforms all the way from the wells up to you know processing facilities, so we model the phenomena, artificial lifting, flows, pressure drops. So it's a very complex model, and there are all sorts of models depending on the kind of platform you're, you're talking about. And then we integrate all these platforms through a subsea pipeline, imposing constraints and limitations, so you have a system with several production units that share resources, that impose constraints on one another, Facilities and goals, in particular, the high CO2 content is a major constraint on this system. So this, this is a, a, a challenge because the system is also, also evolving in time. So you need a solution that will be effective and also adaptive. And that you cannot rely simply on humans. So you need general models for the production units, models for the shared resources, and you need coordination of this production and control. So you can think of it as a graph, which each node you represent one part of the system, you have source nodes that are platforms, you have manifolds, arcs represent you know, pipelines, or, and so on so forth. I'm not going to go into details on the math on this, but you, you can think of it as a graph. Okay? And then you can associate phases, oil, gas, and water, in the, to this arc, and you have also set of compositions, which will depend on your phase, and then you have variables. You know, you have flows for each node and each phase, for each edge and each phase. And then you have thousands of variables uh, that you represent the process. So with that, you can think conceptually, as we call a mixed integer nonlinear program, which consists of a, an objective where you put together here the local objectives that will depend on this variable that encompasses all the boundary conditions. And you have, oops, all the constraints that represent the, the 
processes, the FPSOs, and the pipelines, so on and so forth. So this is a huge problem, okay, very complex. It's beyond the technology we have to solve that. Uh, we cannot really optimize that directly. So how do we go about that? Well, even if we could put that all together, we wouldn't be able to solve it because it's unmanageably large and not scalable and, and it's not robust. The algorithms don't really work well with the mixed integer nonlinear programming. So the alternative is to use simple representative proxy models. And this is where data comes about. Okay, there's information all over the process, you know, knowledge. But this is a specific point. So one way is to, if you have a domain and you have points here we call breakpoints, sample points, and then you sample your function, uh, you can come up with what you call a piecewise linear approximation. There, you know, there are generalizations, there are all sorts of models. Here are four ways to do that, there are other ways. So these data points may be coming from, from your system directly. You know, you have data from your system or you have a simulator that was tuned to the data and then you sample your simulator. Whatever the, the way you do that, you use the data sample points to obtain a proxy model. But what do you gain from that? Oh. Doesn't seem to be working. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so by developing this piecewise linear proxy model for production platform, terminals, pressure drop, functions, so on and so forth, you, conf you, you transform that MINLP into a MILP. And why is that good? Because MILP is a robust technology that you can solve very large problems. You can find, in, in principle, you can find the global optima, you have certificates of optimality, you have all sorts of theory that you can use in, in software, okay, in algorithms. So you can, in principle, solve this efficiently using decomposition that I'm not gonna go into details. But if you are interested in that, we have this uh, recent paper here uh, that develops this methodology, which is scalable. And very recently, we are developing a derivative-free optimization. and It's gonna be a hybrid, hybridization approach when you optimize directly the simulator. And uh, in fact, this was considered the best paper of this uh, conference on, in oil and gas. But not only that, we developed a technological contribution to Petrobras, which is part of this system they call BRCOP, System of for Petrobras Production Optimization. Um, it consists of a number of things. So there's these computer clusters, there's this platform called InfoGrid that functions as a, an Android or iOS that is a platform on top of which you can build apps. So this system is an app for that, okay? There are, and uh, with that, okay, with the support from, from Info, InfoGrid and, and this, um, you know, lab from Puko Hill, we developed this interface that enables the software, the communication with simulators, the communication with the solvers, with the PI to get data. So it's a very complex thing that in the end comes into being a system that allows the optimization of the system. And the hardest part is not the math. It's hard, but the hardest part is doing that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about another work that I'm very excited about, which is online, online learning control. I started with a postdoc uh, maybe seven years ago, and now I have a very bright master's student who will move on to the PhD. Um, so when you have, this is more about controls and dynamics, whereas the previous talk, the work was about um, static optimization. So when you have systems that are very in time or unstructured systems where it's too expensive to build a model or maybe it's complex. Uh, one such a system is a, is a combination of a pipeline well with a riser. You know, that you have complex phenomena like slugging flow, that sort of thing. So uh, it's a system where a model isn't available or the fixes, physics are very in time. There are all sorts of complications. So one way to go about is that since today you have streams of data being produced uh, and you have computational po power, you can think about black box adaptive control as an alternative to the, con the classic control of such systems that tends to be either too conservative or not robust enough to deal with uncertainty. And we are favoring this technology or this uh, tool called EchoState Networks, which are kind of recurrent neural network that has very interesting pop properties that I'm gonna talk about. So we've done some past 
uh, research that was published last year, I, I forgot to mention, in Neural Networks uh, Journal, and uh, now we have a new work coming, coming up. So what is this equi-state network? Um, it's that standard neural network where the kernel is you set at arbitrarily, okay? So, so this is fixed. So and it, there's dynamics, so this is a nonlinear system that is evolving in time. So A is the vector of state and is evolving in time according to the state itself and in a matrix here that will relate to the state the inputs and the outputs to our, uh, by, uh, by means of a function, which is typically a hyperbolic tangent. Okay, so it's evolving in time. So where does the learning take place? The learning takes place by linear combination of the, of the, of the states of the kernel. And when you do that, your learning problem becomes a convex problem, it actually becomes a, a least squares. And then you can do that online using recursive least squares. Um, so you set the weights using normal distribution. Uh, you make, there are some tricks related to stability, regarding the eigenvalues, so on and so forth. But the key point is that input-output relation is linear here. And this you can be trained using least squares, in particularly ridge regression to give some sort of uh, better stability. Okay, so this network is called equistate because it has this property that if you give sufficient time, uh, you'll come to a point when the state of the network represents the effect caused by a sequence of recent inputs, regardless of your initial conditions. So it, it will forget the past, okay? So, and once you have this equistate, there's a theorem, there's a very nice paper that was published in Science. There was the first paper on equistate networks that states the following, the network can approximate dynamic systems training only the weights of the output. So this is very cool, okay? So we are using this network to do what we call online learning control. So the idea is the following. You know nothing about the system, you have the system there, and you wanna learn the optimal control for that. So what do you do? You train a network here, which is this learner, the input to, to the learner, to the, this network is, you consider the output now, the delayed output and the delayed input. You want to learn this. Given the, the current output and the past output, what was the past input to the network? That's what you want to learn. Because if you have that, then you can shift in time and then you say, well, suppose I wanna be in the future at this state, okay? Delta units of time in the future, I wanna be at that state, I'm at this state now, not really state, but I'm, I'm, I can observe this, then what should be my, my input? So the network will feed me with that, and then I can control the system. Okay, so we did this complex application where we have two wells connected with a riser and all sorts of configuration, but is this is one of, one of the configurations where we are controlling the, the lift rate injection each, each well, and you are keeping the, um, the production choke fully open, which creates instability, okay? Because these, these wells are, are, they have um, is, is slugging behavior. And, uh, and the objective here is to control the, 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 the pressure, the inlet pressure of the riser. So if you have an optimization system that you set the optimal target, you need a control that will take your, your system there. So this is what, it, what that is doing, okay? So we did the data, we got a lot of data from uh, very sophisticated uh, simulation model, phenomenological model. So the data is divided in three parts. You have the training part, where you let the control learner, le online learning control learn. And then you have a validation part where you're gonna change the set point gradually, okay? In a controlled manner, which is the sort of thing that is expected in, in a system. You're not gonna take abrupt, you know, changes in your control settings. Nobody likes to do that. And then you do a, another generalization where we take changes totally at random to check the robustness of this controller. Uh, we consider two error metrics. This is a, well, it's a kind of error between what you, your, your predict, predictions, okay, the actual output and the predicted output. And then you also have another metric that will evaluate 
how much control effort your controller is imposing on the system. So this is the mean variation. You know, there's this metric, and this is the uh, every trajectory error. So these are the results, and they, they are very impressive. It took a lot of time to do that. It's not that simple to get all this working, but as you can see, this is the first part where you have the learning, and then you have part of the of the of the of the simulation time where you, we are forcing the system to follow a given trajectory, it's falling nicely, and then you have here random uh, set point. So you, you can see. Uh, in this part where the system is being excited during the learning part and it stabilizes, converges, and then you can see some more action towards the end when you are imposing major changes. I'm coming to the end. Okay, some final remarks. What have I presented to you? Um, how to use data to, to build proxy models based on piecewise linear approximation, and how to use data for online control of complex, well, riser systems. Okay, so this is nice work. I'm gonna jump this and come here to, to I'm going to talk about our future work, I'm going to talk about digitalization. So what do I see as the goal in digitalization? From this point of view of systems engineering, control engineering, optimization. We seek automated means to transform data and measurements into effective decisions. So you want to take, you have a process, you have inputs, and you, uh, sorry, here's a outputs, this is a typo. Uh, so, we want a way to, to get the outputs into a decision-making process that will convert that into the knowledge in the, in, the, in the neural network, the knowledge is within the kernel, the weights that you learn, and then you wanna affect your process so that you get the result that you want. Okay, with that, I wanna uh, thank the organizers for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I I think we leave the questions again to the uh, final uh, round table okay. in order to, um, and then uh, Jose Ricardo Uchoa Almeida, professor at the Federal University of Bahia. We met in an international energy conference in June in Groningen, in Holland, and we started to discuss digitalization. And I think your presentation on the new digital transformation in downstream oil and gas industry might be a very good introduction to the round table. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for invitation. My pleasure is a, I think that's a great opportunity to exchange information and idea, ideas about the digital revolution, digital transformation. Uh, in the previous presentation, we can see the potential of digital transformation. Now, I will try to talk a little bit about the impact in the companies, in the jobs, in the new skills that we will need. It's my agenda, okay? Uh, first of all, it's important to understand uh, that we can have uh, many strategies to implement digital transformation. Uh, here, just to illustrate, I can talk about the automaker. Uh, for instance, in this here, in the first step, we can use digital tech transformation for existing business model, uh, improve efficiency, operation, predict maintenance. Uh, in the second step, we can try to, to get adjacent markets. Uh, for instance, uh, we more connect cars, automakers could sell driver data with insurance companies to inform premiums. And finally, we can give you one more step in terms of automakers and uh, we move into car share, uh, creating revenues from more of a, a rental model. 
than car ownership. It's a, it's a big challenge for automakers now. When you look for uh, Sorry. Now I will try to talk about the dimension in terms of work. We talk in terms of technology, cultural behavior, professional qualifications, process, and business environment. Here we can see the dimension technology in terms of oil and gas company. Uh, we are talking in terms of uh, uh, new technologies and the impact in the oil and gas industries. We can see in this uh, experiment, adoption, takeoff, and sustainable growth. Just to illustrate, let's talk in terms of digital technology. It is the vision of a, oil, a big oil company, okay? We can see that it's sustainable growth now, okay? When you talk in terms of electric car, uh, we can see takeoff now, okay? Uh, so we can look for dimension of technology. We can see the strong impact. Again, to illustrate, here we can see industrial internet of things, predict analytics, just to understand the impact, for instance, in supply chain optimization, we can work with more lower storage, storage and fast time to market. Uh, now I would like to show the first case study. Uh, we have, for instance, a petrochemical company uh, in Bahia and I'd like to, to make a description of the current method. Uh, the product is a viscous fluid, is analyzed by online chromatography every eight hours per day, or three times per day, okay? The idea uh, uh, is to evaluate uh, if the fluid is meeting with the specification. Uh, there is another problem, is a solid particulate material, so it's, uh, it's not analyzed and it is visually inspected when a sample is collected, okay? Now, the solution, né? description of the proposed method. This, the system is composed for an optical transducer installed in the bot line of the column. Uh, this optical transducer pass the product to be controlled, composed also and mainly by a system of treatment of data and learned by artif artif artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a startup and it's a real case, okay? Let me show more details. We are talking about these components. It's a, the first application. Uh, it's important to mention that uh, the, it's the idea of Professor Eduardo San from Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. It's, it's interesting because he suspends work contract with the university and now he is a owner of this startup, X Machine. Uh, there is a, a, a important advanced technology, in my opinion here. We are talking about our ARI, is a sensor, but is more than just a sensor. It's a small brain. It's the idea, okay? Let me explain better. When we talk about the IoT, we assume distribution sensors without brain. And the idea here is that the sensor have a small brains and can make actions, control. 
the conceptual is of a small automatic brain placed to take care of a particular product process. In this context, the TOR, the equipment, works as the human eye capable of identifying real time the quality of the process and the care of a ring. Here we can see the results. In the red is the measures uh, from the equipment, and the blue is the chromatophical application, eight hours, three times per day, okay? Just to, under just to understand this graph here, let me show. What you just saw was the comparison between airing curves, 25 diagnostics per second, and laboratory analysis that tank three times per day. We are talking in terms of for 48 virtual sensors generated by TOR, this uh, 1.2 billion processed information per minute, 25 op diagnostic per second. It's really important uh, for the application because in, in the current process, we have the uh, mensures three times per day, and now we have like 25 optical diagnostics per second. O, o, in other words, in other words, we are talking in terms of the online measure. Uh, a little bit more about culture behavior. Uh, it's important to mention that the life cycle is short more and more. We are talking in terms of, just to illustrate, average turnover in a job, five 4.5 years is the cycle now. It's important to mention uh, that there is a, 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 a big gap between technology, technology change and business productivity. Here, this graph here show this gap in terms of technology, individual, business, and public policy. To illustrate better this, uh, when I talk about process, I would like to, to show uh, how, for instance, how the Brazilian University is, is, a, is, a, is a big gap in terms of technology and process. Let me show in the next moment. Professional qualification is it's another big problem for everyone. Uh, the most important here is to mention that the traditional manufacturing jobs is requiring new adaptive skills. It's a graph, it's a gra graphs that shows the, the new uh, adaptive skills that is necessary, okay? Another case study here, uh, for instance, the Federal University of Bahia, né, the Department of Statistics uh, of the Institute of Mathematics, the Federal University, uh, address statistics computational and mathematical techniques for the analysis and manipulation of large volumes of information with the intention to give background about data science. For, uh, we have some companies in Bahia that we, we need, we uh, supply with uh, courses of qualifications. Just to give more details, uh, the module one, we are talking in terms of fundamentals, mathematics, statistics, and programming. No? Module two, machine learning. Module three, big data and deep learning. Here we have uh, more details about these courses. It's, I think that's an important target for the university. Here, just to illustrate, is a, a National Institute of Science and Technology of Petroleum Geographics, uh, where, where UFBA is the head of this institute. Finally, in terms of the process, as I mentioned before, uh, everyone here that works in universe, for instance, can see how we need to change how we need to keep 
in direction of the new technologies. Uh, just to, we have, we, we need to work a lot of papers, and you can use, for instance, this new process using digital technology. Okay, just to illustrate. The idea here is just to finish with the paper. It's just to illustrate. I try to be fast, okay? Okay. Now in terms now in terms of business environment, uh, of course. There is a, a, a big change, and the, I think that the universe needs to, to go in this direction. Uh, just to illustrate, we can talk about the Uber, the world's largest tax company, owns no vehicles. And Facebook and Alibaba, we that don't have uh, inventory. Okay. It's a, a consensus. Uh, so I would like to, to talk about new trends. Uh, in my opinion, eh, increased production automation affect professional qualification and employment relationships, replacement of works, elimination of routine work, uh, job and tasks are being redesigned to use more essential human skills and are augmented by technology. Probability of increase in inequality between social class, it's, in my opinion, is a big problem. Increase the migration of works, creates new markets and business models, of course, and change significantly the dynamics of the modern, modern world. Uh, when you think about in terms of uh, startup, uh, these questions are really important. Uh, how to use new disruptive technology, will they generate value for my business, where to use and how to use, when we should start, how to carry out a proof of concept, concept is a big problem, how to make a proof of concept without impact production, how to get investment to develop this technology, how to adapt this technology in our process. There is another last issue that I would like to mention. We are talking in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the final uh, goal is digitalization of manufacturing, process traceability, cloud computer, and many things like this based on industry 4.0, integrate real world and digital constituting essential tools for sustainability. There are many estimates that until 20, 2025 process relate to industry 4.0, we are all reduce consumption of inputs and emissions, increase productivity, avoid retrieving, reduce loss and customize production. It's as the final goal of everything, sustainability. Final considerations, the current industrial revolution is an opportunity for work to become a channel by which people can realize their full potential. To ensure this achievement, we must become more specific and very move fast in understand the changes that are to come in addition to raise awareness of our responsibility in leading to invest and company in this moment of transformation. The biography, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jose. I, I invite all the speakers to, uh, to the table, and then we try to get a dialogue with the audience.
Okay. Uh, do you have an initial question or you have some recommendation to how we run it? It's a question, okay. So I think we start to let the audience um, uh, take around with questions. We have a couple of questions up there and you, you get starting. Oh yes, David Cameron, University of Oslo. I'd like to ask a question to Eric and Eduardo around something which came up in the presentations because we've had what I believe is a core problem or issue in digitalization in that there's this what digitalization in the oil and gas or any capital industry is about is that you've got IT, information technology, and what we call operational technology um, working in the same sort of area. And those are areas where there's been historically great challenges in the industry. Uh, my personal background is I'm an automation and control guy who's found himself in computer science. And what I see is that there's still always, digitalization is about getting IT and OT to work together. And so what we saw is that we had some, you noted that our presentations were reasonably not concrete. And one of the challenges on the presentations made from computer science was if we went concrete in computer science, you'd all go to sleep because all our equations are completely incomprehensible to people like me. And um, I just want to ask a question then, how do we get this um, very important, and also then you then presented digitalization and the digitalization problem was formulated as an input output controller with a model. And that's your way of looking at the world. So it's just a question about how do we get the o IT and OT to work together? So who is going to? You need to use this one. Wow, that's a very tough question to start with. Um, I don't have the answer, but I can tell you something about my experience. Uh, in Petrobras, for instance, they have very rigid systems because of security, um, you know, safety as well. And um, so I, I, it's very hard to get the IT people to, to allow us to do what we want to do. There are all sorts of protocols. And uh, I think for that to really come to being, you need to have some more advanced means to, to ensure safety of the data, of the procedures, and then that could you know, bring this operational part that I find myself in more close, closely in, in contact, in cooperation with the IT. Uh, I was just talking to a former a uh, student of mine who, uh, who happens to be a um, um, researcher in, in IBM Research, he was telling me about this technology called DOCA, I think. And uh, I was very impressed about that. That's the sort of thing we would need, I think. Um, you know, my, my brief answer to a big question would be that the um, I mean, you point to the the uh, you know the gap between the possibilities of digitalization, of of disruption, of change, of you know, uh, and the operational you know institutionalized existing practices um, you know in, in in you know the way I would formulate them. And and I think um, I don't know if there was a moral in my story, you know, um, it would be that yes, there is a gap. Uh, that gap is not going to be closed automatically or by itself or by you know pushing one magic button but you know it will involve you know efforts um, you know there isn't a magic recipe uh, so yeah I think I'll leave it at that my view is that one of the problem related to this is that uh, we are building the f the, the plane during the time that we are flying. I mean, we have uh, thousands of legacy database, then uh, the industry has done an effort for digitalization, which means all the, the documents which was I were in paper has gone to a, PDF, a image PDF file, then now they are desperate asking us to extract content from PDF files. 
And, and finally, we get very good relational database and implement this database, but uh, they are implemented like uh, Iceland of technology. Then we have plenty of database that don't talk each other and has different models to model the reality, so they are not uh, in integrable uh, from the beginning. Uh, and, and we are taking this revolution now, dealing with semantic and data analysis and so on, but when you finally solve this problem, we, are, we will be already in the next step. So my advice is think out of the box, because when you are discussing here data analysis and semantic and machine learning, uh, the problem that is coming is the next generation of the system that, uh, in my opinion, we never say about future when you are in a place like this because people take note and then we'll be responsible for your idea. But I think that in the future we need uh, something like the twins with to provide a full platform for simulation and support the stream of data. EIT will be it will be. Uh, daily thing, we don't think even ab about this anymore. So it's time for at least people that work with research to, to think after that analysis, not on that analysis. Okay. Um, so my question is for Professor uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Eduardo. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed your, your talk, um, and you showed a specific example on how to use uh, recurrent uh, neural networks to, to, uh, to optimize, and, and, uh, uh, and my question is, you use data from, from a simulator, you did mention which simulator you use, but to train your, your recurrent neural network, and from as a fu fluid uh, mechanist who works on uh, on uh, fundamental research of uh, multiphase flows, I would like you to make a comment on how important the accuracy of the simulator, the accuracy of the data you use for training is, and how the uh, uh, the accuracy of your optimization scales with uh, with the uncertainty in uh, in the data. Well, uh, that's a very good question, too. In fact, um, for a control engineer, a controller without robustness, they will typically say it's worthless. So you need to have robustness. Um, and then, um, so I, f there are two questions, I think, on the table. The first about the simulator. Okay, for this case, it's a pilot project. We relied on, on a model that was developed by Professor Skugestad and his former students at NTNU where they have models, uh, physical models for the wells and the risers. So we used that, that, that model uh, to produce the data. <coughs> Regarding the second question, well, uh, very important question. I mean, this is, you know, science is still, I mean, it's a, li it's a little far, it's far from being deployed into, into practice. You would need all sorts of watchdogs you know, other, you know, standard controllers that if this, if this controller there's something wrong, they will bring back to the operating point. But what we did in the, in the analysis was a host of analysis. One of the analysis was to change the parameters of the, of the plant. So I'm learning the wrong plant, okay? And then I go back to the plant when I'm doing the testing, so that will give me robustness. And we, we managed to show that the neural network was able to bring the system back to its, because it has this online learning ability. As, fa as, as long as you are open to learn and you, you, you are seeing that your predictions are not correct, you feed that back, then you have learning. In fact, there's a whole body of research and science, reinforcement learning, feedback controls that go, in, go into that to um, provide robustness. Thank you. Can I, can I, um Ask, drop in and ask a question to the panel about uh, the future, what we are now talking about. I have two questions. The first one is that you say we have to think out of the box. We have to think new. And all the academics in the universities and the research institutes, they are with you. But we are using the use cases in companies. I 
ask you, do we need to train them a little bit to rethink how to use these capabilities? Because you th we are t we you're striving to think out the box, but it will be inside a structure in the companies that is not adjusted to what they need. And the scary thing is they don't understand it. That's the first question. The second one is to reflect a bit how, how can we go forward now in the collaboration between um, Brazil Academy, Norwegian Academy, and the industry? What, 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 do we, what can we do together? I will start with the second question because I was thinking about in the previous in the previous sessions also. Uh, I I am uh, running now a cooperation with uh, Sirius Lab uh, from Norway, and I have a long experience in international cooperation because I've been cooperating with IFP of, of Paris for 12 years. Um, uh, and now we are starting uh, common projects uh, with company also in international cooperation. We have several uh, legal and technical issues, but uh, for the academic cooperation and even research cooperation, we need to deal with some imbalance from, from Brazil and, and Norwich. For our students and technique, uh, techniques to go to, to Norway and stay there longer, we have the problem about the level of uh, Brazilian scholarship. So cost of life in a wonderful place like Oslo is very high. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's one of the, the, uh, the more expensive cities in the world in many, many evaluations. And, and our students, in, in general terms, they don't get a bad scholarship in, in, in general world terms, but for us, it's very low. Then, then the, the, the group of uh, the, the Norwegians, the Vikings guy, needs to think about uh, providing some additional support for receiving Brazilian students, like a house, I don't know, transportation, something that can be done can be given over, uh, uh, in addition to the Brazilian scholarship. In the opposite side, uh, the challenges to receive foreigners in Brazil is that nobody speaks English in this country, which is awful. Faha is here, is facing this problem. Inside of the university, it's like a bubble that everybody can speak English and communicate uh, very well. Everybody means that the the administrative support of the university is not the case, but the students in general, but uh, when they leave the university and they, they need to rent a house or a place to stay or buy, I don't know, bread in the corner, that's very complicated to face. We have uh, some cooper international cooperation of double diploma with German universities uh, and also from Grenoble uh, in France. Uh, Latin language, they can get adapted very quick, but for Germans, most, many students has just give up after the second month because they incapable of dealing with uh, life outside of the university. And we can blame our students, but this, it won't be uh, fair because I can see that now, our students is, is coming to the university, at least a good university like mine, is speaking English, but uh, the lecture doesn't. <laughs> so it's complicated also. We need to think about teaching in English in, inside of the class. We cannot think about being international, uh, having international universities in Brazil when we lecture are not able to teach in English in class, and most of us are not. I can add a comment on your first question. I think uh, being a, coming from industry to, to research or more academic part, uh, one important thing that I have observed is that most, I would not say most of the time, but sometimes we actually try to solve a wrong problem. Uh, we, and this is where we need co a strong collaboration between industry and academia. We need to understand how the users are working, what actually challenges they are facing. 
Another thing that I have observed is that uh, research community have more focus on publishing uh, papers, publishing results, uh, which is very good, of course. This is what they are, they, they are supposed to do. But we need to make sure that we do a proper technology transfer. Uh, we need to make sure that the technology that we are developing, people use it. Uh, we, uh, I have experienced that we, for example, made a very good piece of technology or piece of software, but this is the only research community who have ability to run that software. And they don't have time to give support to companies or the end users. So it, this is what need to be fixed. We need to have a proper way of this uh, technology transfer from research to more the industrial deployment. You can say your own opinion. Plenty of researchers here in the room. We have a question in the back there. No, you will need to use this one. Even with my hip. Well, this is, this is maybe just a comment. Um, something that I saw recently, or I learned recently, that it could be very nice to introduce uh, let's say to the interaction between companies or oil companies and universities are the format of challenges or these uh, Kaggle competitions, you know. So uh, the oil companies, they state a problem and they release the data to the academic community. And then the academic community or like the people uh, suggest like a solutions to those, right? Um, so th that is a let's say a very nice way to to innovate and like uh, and to propose solutions and uh, to, to new problems, and um, and other type of uh, competitions that recently we saw were like uh, this Olympus competition that ran in in Barcelona where ENO from Delft released a, a reservoir simul uh, a reservoir model that was available to everybody to suggest like uh, how to control or how to uh, how to design the, the field right. Um, so that's maybe something we can we can do to to speed up innovation. Yes, okay, shall I use a couple of minutes to briefly tell you heard the word Brew Twenty One, and you will meet it also in this relation between Brazil and Norway. And uh, this is an initiative at the uh, NTNU the University. You can find the update information. It's just in the beginning on um, NTNU dot edu slash brew 21. Brew is better resource utilization in the 21st century. It is about a um, two year work in Norway that the NTNU with the chair of this gentleman up there, Egil Chola, he is the head of the department of uh, geoscience and petroleum. And he wanted to, uh, he got the job actually from NTNU to uh, revisit the um, uh, R&D strategy at NTNU for the oil and gas business. And then he called me, I'm a freelancer, but I have been working with NTNU and uh, in many places on the way, but I know the industry very well. And uh, we started to work. We visited uh, all the oil companies, all the suppliers in oil during nine months, fact finding, reports we wrote for ourselves. We picked actually what was it, the strategic, strategic issue for the future. We, it boiled down to six main areas, not directly detailed technologies, but main areas. And one of these main areas is what Eric talked about, new business models. All oil companies, all suppliers, they talked, told us that this digitalization opportunity, we need to think differently, also organizational. F five other topics, and you will find them on the, on the net if you look into it. Okay, uh, the next step, we wanted to, we had a report, you can download it. We had a conference and then we make it the next step. And we decided at the NTNU, first of all, to highlight the delivery of knowledge, solutions and people to the oil and gas business. In Norway, it is a challenge to get universities to realize that we have to deliver to the oil and gas business. Uh, it is underneath energy, it's more environmental, sustainable, etc. 
So it, we, we, are, we are going to lack people, I'm sure. But anyhow, we, we took the next step to build an environment, an innovation environment on digital and automation solutions for the oil and gas. So the goal is to establish an, um, an innovation environment uh, with 40 PhD postdocs working entirely on this. And the drive force is that we ask the industry to pay for 30 of these PhDs, sponsor them, and then enter new, put 10 in the pot. And the key is to ask the industry for use case. We defined a challenging topic in the company, at a field, and we get access to the data. So it is a use case driven innovation process. Egil take care of the, and his team take care of the academic part, but we want to make a culture of innovation, and that in itself is a challenge, because we have to protect these 40 people, these 40 brains, the young ones with the updated education. We have to protect them for the hunger for companies to have IP. There are some fundamentals in order to obtain uh, innovation in a team. And we, are, we don't know the results. I would like to uh, listen to, uh, um, to, to, um, to advice, but how to get a multiplier multiplier out of this, then you have actually to protect some sort of the intellectual property right. Entenu is has a model of um, contracts so that uh, Entenu is the owner, and later on we get spin-off. So you can follow it on the, um, on the uh, website. We are on the way, we are 60% on the way, but it will be very focused towards the industry. And we are in dialogue with the Petrobras and some other universities to see if this environment, in addition to all uh, the rest, could be some sort of a vehicle in, in the future collaboration. Maybe I should challenge you. Yes? yes. To, uh, to, to, to what, what does it take to get this collaboration? Norway, Brazil, and you are involved in many aspects. Yeah, I've, I've been, been involved in all these November conferences since the beginning, and I think it's important to be around for a while to understand each other. Uh, language is, of course, an, a challenge, as you mentioned, Mara, but uh, it's improving every year. Since the first time I came here in 2006, it's much, much easier to, uh, to speak English together and discuss these challenges we have. And I also want to comment on the role of universities towards industry. There will always be a tension there because our role as universities is to look far ahead and challenge uh, uh, science with new thoughts that maybe is not relevant for the industry today, but might be in the future. However, at the same time, we have to deliver. We have to look at our results and see are these results uh, applicable for the industry today. And that was also uh, mentioned here. There. So at any time, we need to have two thoughts. One thing is that is very important for universities is to look ahead, try to challenge ideas, uh, foster or fuel the free thought, and at the same time, make our results av as available to, um, to applications and industry and, and public sector. And uh, this is the challenge that we will always have. And of course, in that respect, there is a tension, and this tension has to be there. And I think it's very important that it is there. Uh, you had the question about uh, the future, digitalization. Uh, digitalization has been around for many, many years. I think it was first described in uh, the um, Oxford English Dictionary in the mid-50s. And uh, it has improved, and they say that about five, six years ago, the world was fully digitized in some sense. However, digitalization will go on. And uh, one of the things that the, the huge discussion in, on the political side is how digitalization fuels up on globalization. What about what happens when things converge? For example, the, the notion of machine learning is now all in all sciences. I am dean at the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences uh, at the University of Oslo, and I think we have uh, nine departments, and machine learning is popping up everywhere. And of course, that's because the increase in the amount of data that has been available. So um, I'm really looking forward to, I've been here in Brazil now for 10 years, or, and this is the sixth uh, November conference. I'm looking forward to future collaboration. 
and I think we have gained a lot, and there is a lot of possibilities in, in the future. So uh, and, uh, to speculate about digitalization in the next uh, 10, 15 years, I think we have to do that next year and the year after. So thank you very much. We are soon uh, finalizing it, but again, could I challenge you? You have been in this business between Norway and, uh, and Brazil for a while, and you're running this project. Okay, I take the challenge. Uh, good afternoon, or well, good morning, I guess. Uh, my name is Egil Cholan uh, at the uh, and, and NDNU, and I am um, uh, heading the Department of Geoscience and Petroleum. So, um, yes, the challenge uh, here is maybe I can go back to the Brew 21 initiative that Ariel just talked about. So, this was a really good. Uh, uh, kind of uh, process that we run uh, for one and a half years. We visited all these companies and we visited all uh, authorities in Norway to see how we could uh, cooperate uh, in this important uh, uh, issue. So my challenge is maybe, and give kind of this challenge to our Brazilian friends here, why not uh, kind of do the same thing here? Uh, like the universities, go to all the oil companies and just challenge the oil companies to see well, how could you come up with some ideas or how or get ideas to to kind of get into better um, collaboration. So uh, my challenge would maybe be to you to have a kind of a Brew 20 or Bra 21 maybe, Brazil 21. So that is maybe my my challenge. Yeah, and we, we are sneaking a little bit also because we have a dialogue to sell the idea to make a Brut 21 twin in, in, in Brazil. We'll see. Uh, I will give you an example. What is innovation? It is to use established technologies in new ways. And I will give you a very good example. You see my hip. I, I need this to, uh, because I'm going to operate the hip. So I invested. This one is uh, 150 reals. You can... But my innovation is that I uh, discovered that with this instrument here, and I will never let it go no big on all my future travel, because you pass all the queues, the police invite you to, uh, <laughs> to go quickly through the custom. When you arrive in Rio, you're invited on an electric car, and you can uh, be driven to the uh, passport, and you get the first line. So the innovation is actually for travel. But I, I, I mean about thinking about them out of the box. <laughs> That's an example of innovation. But I think we are at the final, it's a lunch time, and I think we got a very good overview of different aspects. And uh, we're looking forward to the next year. We probably will see each other there. And um, we, in, we, we will also may, we list, visit this Brew website. And if you have possibilities, you are all invited to enter new in one way or another. We might organize a brew conference uh, next year. We'll see how it goes. So I'll first of all thank the speakers and give them the uh, grand uh, hand. <laughs> and that is lunch time. If for, for those of you who want a small quick, we have a small flyer here.